the Donners Grove Historical Society invites you to step back into the history of Donners Grove. The place, the people, and the events of the past make up this video, which was prepared by the Donners Grove Historical Society in cooperation with the Park District Museum. Many of the slides came from the museum collection. Virginia Staney and I arranged the pictures and wrote the script. Virginia is the author of the history of the Downers Grove Fire Department and was a past president of the Historical Society. I am Montru Dunham and I co-authored with Pauline Wanschneider the history of Downers Grove, which was published in 1982. And now it is my privilege to present Images of the Past, 1832 through 1945. vast, untouched prairie, a sea of grass, often towering above the head of a man on horseback, stretched across the northern part of Illinois in 1832, with only occasional groves of oak trees. The Potawatomi Indians lived here in small villages and hunted. Indians like Black Hawk, and men from other tribes had fought the white intruders here and further west, but the conflict was settled by the treaties at the end of the Black Hawk War. And it was in 1832 that Pierce Downer, a 50-year-old man from New York State, followed an Indian trail from Fort Dearborn to this area. He is shown here as an old man. According to his own records, Downer's eyes fell upon an oak grove rising majestically from the prairie, and he knew he had found the place he was seeking. He camped that first night in the grove of oak trees and settled in to lay claim to 160 acres in what later became the northwest part of Downer's Grove, and he eventually sent for his family to join him. Some years earlier, in 1816, a 10-mile corridor of safe transport had been negotiated for both white settlers and Indians from Lake Michigan southwest to the headwaters of the Illinois River. The northernmost boundary of this corridor, called the Indian Boundary, goes diagonally through present-day Downers Grove. In 1835, Dexter and Nancy Stanley, with their nine children, traveled in covered wagons for over five weeks across southern New York State, through Ohio and southern Michigan, and onto this area, where they were the first family to settle. The Stanley family swelled the population considerably. Prior to their arrival, there were only four men and three log cabins. The next year, Avis and Israel Blodgett, shown here in old age, settled on land south and east of present-day Maple Avenue and Main Street. Blodgett built a blacksmith shop where he made and repaired tools, plows and horseshoes, and shod horses. Indians came with firearms to be repaired. The early settlers found the Indians with their chiefs, Shabona and Wabansi, to be helpful and friendly. When Samuel Curtis arrived from Vermont with his family, he bought the north part of Blodgett's claim. And the downtown section of present-day Downers Grove is on former Curtis land. Soon, Blodgett and Curtis widened and smoothed the Indian trail 
which lay between their properties, making it into a road to attract travelers and trade from Naperville to Chicago, present day Maple Avenue. And some of the maple trees they planted along the road are still standing. Early settlers wrote glowing letters to relatives and friends back east about the rich, available farmland. Soon others came by various routes from New England, New York, and Pennsylvania. The Erie Canal, which had been completed across New York State in 1825, connected the Hudson River to Lake Erie and opened the water route from the east to settlers going west. In this area, Henry Carpenter opened the first general store and post office in 1842 in a house which is still standing at Maple Avenue and Lane Place. By 1850, immigrants from Europe seeking a better life began to arrive from England, Ireland, Germany, and Alsace-Lorraine. Many traveled here from Chicago on the Illinois-Michigan Canal, which had been completed in 1848. From the beginning of the settlement, schools were very important. As early as 1836, Blodgett had built a lean-to against his cabin to provide a school for his children and his neighbor's children. Curtis and Stanley each erected schoolrooms on their land. Much later, one-room schools like this appeared. This one was located south on Dunham Road. The pupils were from nearby farms. In the village after the Civil War, a brick two-room school with later additions was built on Maple Avenue and called the Maple Avenue School. It stood where Lincoln School was subsequently erected. Many generations of grade school children passed through Lincoln School. Several additions were made to Lincoln, one accommodating the high school. And here is a high school graduating class of 1879. Then in the 1890s at Washington and Prairie, another two-room school was built. It too needed additions in a very short time. It was the North Side School, later Washington School. In 1912, the private Avery Cooney Kindergarten was opened on Grove Street. Longfellow and Whittier Public Schools, with identical floor plans, were built in 1928 as well as a community high school on North Forest Avenue. This building with additions and renovations, many renovations, is our present North High School. Now back to 1851, when traveling had become somewhat easier, when a toll road made of heavy wooden planks was opened from Chicago to the preemption house in Naperville called the Southwestern Plank Road, it was the roadway which is now Ogden Avenue. The Downers Grove toll gate was a frame house near where Wanamaker's Nursery is now located. The toll from Naperville to the Cook County line was 50 cents for a four horse coach, 37 cents for a two horse wagon, and 26 cents for a one-horse buggy. When Ogden Avenue was repaired in 1981, some of the original planks from the old plank road were found, and one is now in the museum collection. In 1856, 45 young men in Downers Grove formed a political organization, which they called the Plowboys, to campaign for Fremont the new Republican candidate for president. The Republican Party had been founded only two years previously in Ripon, Wisconsin. Fremont lost the election, but four years later, the Plowboys again campaigned, this time for Abraham Lincoln. This group 
portraying the Plowboys at Downers Grove Centennial Celebration was much less impressive than the original Plowboys who wore red and white uniforms on an eight by 24 foot wagon drawn by eight black horses. The ladies of the village presented a dark blue silk banner to the Plowboys. This banner has been displayed in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington in the exhibit on Americana. During the Civil War, the village of Downers Grove sent well over 100 men to the Union Army. Not a family was left untouched as the men marched off to war. Wells Blodgett, Captain T.S. Rogers, and Captain Walter Blanchard, the latter 54 years old, each recruited a company for an Illinois regiment. In May of 1864, during the war, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad finished construction of a branch line passing through Downers Grove, which linked Chicago and Aurora. The station was built the following year. For some time, there were holding pens beside the tracks for cattle to be shipped to Chicago. At first, one train a day traveled in each direction, with passengers often having to ride in freight cars with grain and other produce. However, within five years, commuter trains were operating, and by 1895, trains ran daily between Downers Grove and Chicago. In 1871, the devastating Chicago fire had a profound effect on Downers Grove. Captain T.S. Rogers and other village residents lost their businesses in Chicago as a result of the fire, and villagers rallied to take provisions and clothing to those who had lost their homes. In the early 1870s, with a village population of about 350 people, some thought it was time to incorporate as a village. So, in 1873, an election was held at the offices of Warren Rogers in this building, resulting in 49 votes for incorporation and 38 against. A board of trustees was elected with Captain T.S. Rogers as president. By 1874, the area was bustling. There was J.W. Sucre's brick blacksmith shop, shown here years later when Sutter was the blacksmith. The shop was built at the southwest corner of Maple and Main, where the considerably remodeled building still stands. There were attractive homes, a maker and repairer of wagons and carriages like this vehicle, three physicians and surgeons, the Beardsley Hotel, and of course, many farms. In 1883, the Downers Grove Reporter began publication. After several other locations, newspaper space was rented in the Kelmscott Press Building at Forrest and Warren from 1908 to 1918. The Reporter is the oldest business in Downers Grove and one of the three centennial businesses in the village. Mogul's True Value Hardware, another centennial business, opened on Main Street in 1884 as Mertz & Mogul selling coal, feed, salt, fencing, nails, and more. Mokels in the same location was the oldest business owned and operated by the same family for well over a hundred years. Dickey Tool Company is our third centennial business. Casper Dickey started his machine shop in Chicago in 1886 and moved it to Downers Grove three years later. This was the first industry in the village. The company on Warren, west of Forest, is still family-owned and family-run. 
The 1890s were a decade of considerable change. E.H. Prince subdivided land in the northwest part of the village, improved the pond, now called Prince Pond, and added a small park around it. The first nine-hole golf course west of the Appalachian Mountains was opened in the area. This course is now owned by the Downers Grove Park District. In early years, golfers included members of the newly formed Chicago Golf Club, which included Abe's son, Robert Todd Lincoln. Later, the caddies also enjoyed the course. A roundhouse and turntable were built at Oakwood and the track, where the train yards were located. About half the suburban trains were serviced here and returned to Chicago, and the rest continued on to Aurora. The Farmers and Merchants Bank, with its unusual tourists, was built on the northeast corner of Maine and Curtis. The building, massively altered, now houses Muriel Mundy's shop, other stores, and apartments. A volunteer group of women founded the Ladies' Library Association and opened a free lending library on the second floor of the bank building. Two years later, a brown, one-room building was erected for library use where the Downers Grove National Bank driveway is now located. A new, large library was built in 1915 on the site of the present library, made possible by funds from Andrew Carnegie and a gift of the site by John Oldfield. On May 1, 1893, the World Columbian Exposition opened in Chicago, and life was never the same. Downers Grove residents and their guests went to see the breathtaking electric lighting, the beautiful building, exhibits, and architecture from around the world, the enormous Ferris wheel on the Midway, and nearby Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show. At the turn of the century, local businesses flourished. Farmers came into town to buy provisions, while residents could have delivery of newspapers, meat, ice, and groceries. The ladies shopped at Seelig Sisters for hats and dry goods. The blacksmith shop continued to make and repair tools and plows, shoe horses, and to be a meeting place for men of the community. Other businesses included a livery stable, a cobbler, and a general store. Guy Bush's pharmacy was at this location before Neal's pharmacy was there. Bush was village president in 1897 and 98 and state representative in the Illinois legislature from 1898 through 1910. In the early 1900s, immigrants began to arrive in this area from Eastern Europe, reflecting the change in immigration nationally. The community of East Grove, or Gostin, located along Fairview north of the railroad, was primarily Polish. From the earliest days, Worshipping together had been important to the settlers, oftentimes with itinerant preachers. Later, of course, churches were organized. Among the first were the Congregational, Baptist, Methodist, Evangelical and Reformed, United Brethren, and Roman Catholic. By the turn of the century, the village had experienced considerable growth and change. Electric lights, telephone services, and a waterworks and water tower, which made firefighting easier for the volunteer fire department. The fire department had been organized in 1898 and soon had horse-drawn hose carts. Years later, as a result of fires at the Dickey Tool Company, 
the seven sons of Casper and Frida Dickey dedicated untold years of service to the department. Shown here are Casper Dickey, his seven sons, and three grandchildren as presented in a 1929 Chicago Daily News photo and article. Grant Dickey served for 55 years, including 41 years as chief. Elmer Dickey served over 50 years, many as assistant chief. The others also had many years of service. In 1921, the fire department raised money to buy its first motorized pumper truck. Shown here with Chief Grant Dickey in the driver's seat with Elmer beside him. The first fire station was built on Warren Avenue in 1928. In the early 1900s, automobiles had begun to arrive in the village and in 1907, the Dickey Theater with its kitchen chairs opened on the northwest corner of Forest and Warren. It was later named the Don Theater. Movies shown there featured Mary Pickford, John Marymore, and other early favorites. Another center of activity was the Cressy Auditorium on the northwest corner of Main and Grove Streets. This was used for Chautauqua, school suppers, plays, exhibits, basketball games, and revival meetings. In the year 1915, Voters approved a change to the commission form of village government with a mayor and four commissioners. When war was declared on Germany in 1917, Downers Grove, along with the rest of the country, showed its loyalty by sending its young men off to the front, and families at home supported the war effort. In 1922, a discovery of worldwide interest was especially important to this village. Dr. James Henry Breston, who had grown up in Downers Grove, was present at the opening of King Tut's tomb at Luxor in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Here, a group, with Dr. Breston on the left, had dinner in a nearby tomb to dispel ideas of a curse on those who entered a tomb. Dr. Breston, the founder of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, was known not only as the first American Egyptologist, but also as an historian, archeologist, author, and translator of ancient languages. That same year, Lottie Holman O'Neill of Downers Grove was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives as the first woman legislator. Senator O'Neill served in the Illinois House and Senate for a total of 38 years. In 1925, the police department moved to a new, large brick village hall. What a change from the previous frame village hall with its one large room and two jail cells. The new hall was located just north of the Main Street Cemetery, where many of the early settlers are buried. Parades have always been popular here, especially on Memorial Day and the 4th of July. They said toes to tapping and make people smile, or tearful when veterans march by. Years ago, they often ended at a picnic or carnival area. The residents enjoyed their park, Railroad Park, Stair Park, and Randall Park. On Christmas Day, 1928, 4,000 people waited in line for the new Tivoli Theater to open its doors for the first time. They had the exciting experience of seeing and hearing a talking picture in the second theater in the United States to be designed and built for talking. A few years later, along with the rest of the nation, 
Downers Grove was plunged into the Great Depression of the 30s. But despite the trying times, the village, with the queen and her court, celebrated its 100 years with an impressive centennial pageant and a parade with a stagecoach carrying veterans of the Civil War, fascinating floats, and decorated cars. The next year, when the city of Chicago celebrated its 100 years with the 1933 Century of Progress, Downers Grove residents attended. One of its many impressive buildings was the Hall of Science. And in 1934, villagers lined the tracks when the first streamlined CB and Q Zephyr came speeding through Downers Grove from Denver at 85 miles per hour. During the Depression years, projects by the WPA, or Works Projects Administration, and PWA, or Public Works Administration, gave employment to local residents. The post office, still at Washington and Curtis, was constructed. It was quite a change from the early quarters in the Farmers and Merchants Bank and the later location on the south side of Curtis Street. Other projects included the building of the high school gym and the relaying of all brick streets in the village and the paving of Highland Avenue. Villagers helped relatives, friends, and neighbors in many ways. For example, in 1931, and for many years, the volunteer firemen collected and repaired toys and dolls. The telephone operators dressed the dolls, and other volunteers gave them to needy children at a Christmas party. After the difficult Depression years came the shock of World War II. But the villagers rallied again, sending their young men off to war, working in war plants, helping in civil defense, and Red Cross work. They bought war bonds, raised victory gardens, and held scrap drives. One volunteer fireman, Harry Walker, was on duty almost continuously from 1941 to 1945. With most of the firemen in the armed forces or working long hours in defense plants, Walker manned the firehouse around the clock, day after day. By the end of World War II, the village of Downers Grove was far different from the few cabins in the 1830s. The population had grown to more than 11,000, though the village was still surrounded by farmland and had much open space within its boundaries. And the changes in the years since the end of World War II are even more dramatic. But that story must be left for another time. Now, a few words about the Downers Grove Historical Society and Museum. The Society, founded in 1966, is dedicated to preserving the history of the village and presenting that history in various ways. Society members opened the first historical museum in two rooms on the second floor of the village hall. In 1973, the Park District offered the Society the house at 842 Curtis for a museum. A final move was made to the present museum building, which opened in January of 1977. This house was built by Charles Blodgett, the youngest son of pioneers Israel and Avis, on Blodgett land. A barn building was erected in 1987 for historical exhibits. To learn more about the history of this area, you are invited to visit the museum at 831 Maple Avenue. To read more about the history in our book, Downers Grove, 1832 to 1982, and to attend the Society's several annual events and programs which are always open to the public. The original slideshow was organized and a script written 
by Virginia Staney and Montreux Dunham in 1990. Carol Buckley Spittler provided archival assistance and Ed Bunting photographic assistance. We do hope that you've enjoyed this view of the history of Downers Grove.